The Edmund Fitzgerald by Kathy Jo Worgan. Long, long ago, deep glaciers lay cold and hard upon the land. Over time, these huge walls of ice began to thaw and move away, scraping deep basins into the earth. As they pushed along, each large depression filled with water from the melting ice, giving birth to a large and powerful body of fresh water we now call the Great Lakes. It was a warm Sunday afternoon on November 9, 1975. This was a time when people wore bell-bottom pants and platform shoes and were learning a dance called the hustle. Gerald R. Ford was president of the United States. A loaf of bread cost 38 cents, and the waterways of the Great Lakes were filled with boat boats carrying coal, salt, lumber, and iron ore. On this day, a group of sailors left port out of the Superior Harbor in Superior, Wisconsin. That morning, the Edmund Fitzgerald had been loaded with 26,000 tons of taconite pellets, which are tiny balls made from refined iron ore. This ore had to be taken to Zug Island in the Detroit River and used to build cars. This was the job of the men aboard the Edmund Fitzgerald, to safely transport the taconite from the Iron Range of Minnesota to ports across the Great Lakes. The bell rings forever where heroes are found, and the full soul of the sailors held in its sound. At 729 feet long, the Edmund Fitzgerald was the largest ship on the Great Lakes from the time it was launched in 1958 until larger ships came along in 1971. Through all its days, it was called the Pride of the American Flag and was the finest carno sh cargo ship on the Great Lakes. Because of this, only the best sailors in the fleet were offered the chance to work on board. The ship plowed its way northeast in a slow, steady way. Captain Gerald Ernest knew that bad weather was blowing in because of the Weather Bureau had issued a gale warning earlier that day. It was now early evening and he knew to pay close attention to the weather as they made their journey. Lake Superior is the deepest and largest of the Great Lakes and its vast size could be troublesome, troublesome when storms blow in. But at that moment this did not seem to bother Captain McSorley or his crew. They had experience with the wild storms of Lake Superior, and they knew their jobs well. So as the ship pushed on, the men kept busy with their duties. John Simmons, the wheelsman, steered the ship, while Nolan Church, the porter, helped serve meals in the ship's galley. John McCarthy, the first mate, assisted the captain while the cook polished the huge bell that sat on top of the pilot house. Every job on the ship was important, but it was usually the tradition for the cook to take care of the 200-pound bronze bell. The bell was buffed and shined to a beautiful golden luster, as if it were a brilliant crown. The bell rang every four hours to announce a change in the watch. Other times it rang to warn a fog, and when it did, it always rang with a rich, lovely sound, reaching deep into the souls of the crewmen on board. By nightfall, the Edmund Fitzgerald had traveled many miles. Captain McSorley knew that the another ship carrying taconite, the Arthur M. Anderson, was traveling behind him. It left port out of two harbors, Minnesota, and was heading to Gary, Indiana. The two ships pushed on through midnight and into the early hours of the morning. As they did, the waves grew around them. Black water whipped into a massive confusion, striking out at the ship. The freshwater sea roared, and it was nearly impossible to tell the rain and the snow from the tops of the waves. But even as the storm raged around them, the 29 men aboard the Edmund Fitzgerald continued with their jobs, watchful and alert. And all the while, the bell remained steadfast as the wind blew all around it. The men changed watch with the sound of the bell. It rang through the storm as the freezing rain fell. At nearly 2 in the morning, a voice came in over the Edmund Fitzgerald radio. It was Jesse Bernie Cooper, captain of the, of the Arthur M. Anderson, he radioed Captain McSorley to talk about the bad weather. They were traveling close together and the shelter of the highlands on a northerly route along the Canadian shore rather than going straight across Lake Superior. Although this route was longer, it would be safer. So the pair pushed on, not knowing what would happen next. The battered bell rang as the storm held its grip. It rang for the men as the heart of the ship. By early afternoon the next day, the Edmund Fitzgerald was far past Isle Royale and the Keweenaw Peninsula, when something began to worry Captain McSorley. His long-range radar was not working, and he needed it to pass safely by the 
Picotetan Island and the Caribou Island. These are two dangerous areas to pass, and Captain McSorley knew he should not get in too close to the Caribou Island because of the Six Fathom Shoal, which is a hard, rocky, shallow area that might tear the ship's hull into pieces. The other ship, the Arthur M. Anderson, was about 16 miles behind the Edmund Fitzgerald. Captain Cooper of the Anderson watched his radar, noticing that the path Fitzgerald was taking as it rounded past Caribou Island. Captain Cooper turned to his first mate, Morgan Clark. Look at this, Morgan! The Fitzgerald is a lot closer to Six Fathom Shoal than I would like my ship to be. Minutes later, Captain McSorley of the Fitzgerald radioed the Anderson and spoke to the first mate, Clark. Anderson, this is the Fitzgerald. I've sustained topside damage. I have a fence rail laid down, two vents lost or damage, and a starboard list. I'm checking down. Will you stay by me until I get to Whitefish? Captain Cooper replied, Roger that, Fitzgerald. Do you have your pumps going? Yes, replied Mick, Captain McSorley. Both of them. As the ship moved on with a terrible list, the bell still rang through the snow and the mist. Captain Cooper was worried. A list meant that Fitzgerald was taking on water and leaning to one side. Damaged vents mean that water might pour into the ballast tanks, which are deep tanks on either side of the ship's cargo. These tanks can be filled with water when a ship is traveling light to make the boat level and the journey safe. But the Fitzgerald was full of cargo. If it took on water, the weight can make the ship so heavy it would sit dangerously low in the water. Anderson, this is the Fitzgerald. I've lost both radars. Can you provide me with radar plots till we reach Whitefish Bay? Roger that, Fitzgerald, said to Anderson. We'll keep you advised of position. The storm was heaving water upon the ship and now both long and short radar were gone. Captain McSorley knew that the Edmund Fitzgerald had to make it to the sheltered lee of Whitefish Point. Getting there was his only hope, and the only hope for the other men as well. But as the Edmund Fitzgerald and the Arthur M. Anderson struggled east, the wind roared and the waves grew even larger. With no radar, Captain McSorley used his, used his radio direction finder to track a beacon signal from Whitefish Point, which assured him he was going in the right direction. The exhausted crew struggled to maintain the ship in the storm, trying to make it to Whitefish Bay. Captain McSorley was tracking his course when suddenly the radio direction beacon from Whitefish Point disappeared. The storm had taken out the power to Whitefish Point. With no guiding radar or radio beacon, the Fitzgerald was blind in the storm. It was dark and cold, and the Edmund Fitzgerald had to fight its way through the night. No one was allowed on deck and the men only held on to the hope that the Fitzgerald would make it to the Whitefish Bay, only 20 miles ahead. At 10 minutes past 7 o'clock that night, First Mate Clark of the Anderson noticed a ship was heading in the direction of the Fitzgerald. Because Anderson was now the acting eyes for the Fitzgerald, he radioed Captain Sorley to sh tell him the ship would pass by safely. After that, the First Mate said, Fitzgerald, this is Anderson. Have you checked down? Yes, we have replied Captain McSorley. By the way, Fitzgerald, how are you making out with your problem? Captain McSorley replied, We are holding our own. The first mate of the Anderson was watching the Fitzgerald progress on his radar when all of a sudden the ship simply vanished from the screen. Captain Cooper ordered his men to search the horizon for the Edmund Fitzgerald. But the men saw nothing. The great ship could not be seen. There, in the blowing snow and pounding waves, the Edmund Fitzgerald and the 29 men aboard it disappeared without a cry for help. There wasn't a sound except for the bell. Some say it rang when the mighty ship fell. The Ed Edmund Fitzgerald was found later, lying broken and twisted on the bottom of Lake Superior, only 17 miles from the shelter of Whitefish Point. The great ship had plunged to the bottom so fast that no one may ever be sure of what caused it to sink. On July 4, 1995, 20 years after the tragic loss of the Edmund Fitzgerald, special divers went to the wreck to recover the bell from the ship. When the divers cut the bell free, it was hoisted to the surface. Along the way, it swung on a cable. The bell chimed again for the sailors, ringing out beautifully as it broke the surface and came into the sunlight for the first time in so many years. A replica bell inscribed with the names of the 29 men who died that night was brought down to the ship where it will remain forever as a tribute to those lost. Then, as a wreath of flowers was tossed upon the water, the family members said goodbye to the men they loved so much. 
today, the bell that rang out from the Edmund Fitzgerald that faithful night is lovingly polished once again, reminding us to honor those sailors and the heritage of our people. It is the her heritage of the water, of the wind, of ships, and of hard-working men and women, and once a year, on the anniversary of the wreck, the bell rings out thirty times, one for each of the twenty-nine men lost that night, and one last time for all mariners lost on the Great Lakes. The bell rings forever where heroes are found, for the soul of the sailor is held in its sound. We tell them goodbye with a loving farewell, but their legend lives on in the song of the bell. The families of the Edmund Fitzgerald's crew were very sad when the ship was lost. The crewmen died suddenly and unexpectedly, never to be recovered. There wasn't a way to have a proper funeral for them. In November of 1994, the family members asked the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society to help them create a memorial for the lost crew of the Fitzgerald. The families met Tom Farnquist, Executive Director of the Shipwreck Society, at the Mariner's Church in Detroit, Michigan. At the meeting, everyone thought that one important artifact from the shipwreck should be brought to the surface, the ship's bell. The Fitzgerald lies in Canadian waters. Permission to raise the bell had to be secured from the Canadian government. A letter encouraging that permission be given was sent to the office of the President of the United States. The family members also wrote letters in support of the effort to raise the bell. With the help of Emery Christoph of the National Guard Society, the Canadian Navy provided a ship and a crew of 85 to the bell recovery expedition. With two mini submarines aboard, the expedition also used the Newt suit, a high-tech underwater diving suit. The Newt suit allowed a diver to get close enough to the bell to carefully remove it from the sh roof of the pilot house. The bell of the Edmund Fitzgerald was recovered from the ship, lying in 535 feet of water. On July 4, 1995, a replica bell engraved with the names of the lost crew members was put back in its place. The replica bell is still on the ship today, serving as a grave marker for the crew. The Edmund Fitzgerald bell is at the Great Lake Shipwreck Museum at Whitefish Point, Michigan, just 17 miles from where the ship lies in Lake Superior. Many people come to visit this museum and see the bell. Now, said the families, we have a place where we can come and remember our loved ones. The end.